We're living through an interesting period of time in which one end of the political spectrum is being censored and suppressed by social media, by the internet, in a way that the other end of the political spectrum is not. My own political views and values are left of center, so I see the harm done by the left-wing extreme much more than I see the harm done by the right-wing extreme. I'm constantly meeting and talking to people who have been seriously damaged and misinformed by communist propaganda. Um, but we're not living through a period of time in which the right wing can openly present neo-Nazi propaganda or can openly present fascist propaganda. They do so covertly and periodically we have scandals in the Western press when the covert nature of their messaging gets exposed. This kind of thing is ongoing. But I'm about to show you just a couple of clips of communists overtly discussing and marketing communism and talking about and even demonstrating for you a little bit how they make excuses for the history of mass murder. These videos are not demonetized. These videos are not suppressed or deleted by YouTube. Whereas right-wing groups face constant threat of their Twitter being deleted, their YouTube channel being deleted, their freedom of expression shut down. This type of left-wing extremist propaganda, YouTube considers itself a neutral platform for. Hello, and welcome very much to marketing, how to market bread communism. Hello, your friendly neighborhood radical reviewer here. Have you heard that communism has never worked? That communism always fails? That communism kills people? I mean, we can look at like a number of communist governments that have failed miserably <laughs> to point to why communism is bad. But is this true? Well, countries embark on various economic projects in various parts of the world at various times in our history, so it's difficult to make such a categorical statement as communism has never worked. In fact, one could easily argue that since these various countries had states and did not have worker control of the means of production, then by definition they were not communist. Let's take a look at key factor number two, downplaying the achievements of communist experiments. Well, let's see. Here's a study using World Bank data which found that socialist countries had higher quality of life than capitalist countries when controlling for a level of economic development, using criteria such as life expectancy, literacy, daily caloric intake, and access to higher education or housing. Or what about this Oxfam America report on Cuba which details the achievements of the Cuban Revolution? Basically, my point is this. Behind the assumption that every attempt at communism just naturally failed because communism has contradictions within it that causes it to fail, that ignores the influence capitalist interventionism has had on attempts at communism. And it ignores the positive aspects of these nations that we should strive for. So the next time someone argues that communism has never worked, or that communism always fails, or that communism killed 500,000 gazillion people, recognize that they probably have no idea what they're talking about. Don't think about your, you know, small channel with your small sub count as meaningless, because if you took all the little tiny channels on left tube and you put them all together, that's a ton of reach and impact that we're having. Let's now contrast this to a short clip from Frank Decoder. This is under five minutes long. I constantly face this uh, supercilious attitude from left-wingers that anyone who disagrees with them, they just don't know what they're talking about. I've devoted many years of my life to studying the history of communism, and Frank Decoder has devoted many years of his life, and he's now published many books, to studying the history of communism, especially in China. shouldn't really come as a surprise uh as a surprise to anyone familiar with one party states in, in particular you know the, the sort of leninist marxist variety if you study the history of the soviet union you will know that 1917 is followed by a very brutal civil war and of course a red terror and you can say the same thing about any other one party state um, throughout the 20th century. So China is no exception. 
So if I would have to summarize it very quickly, let's say in minutes, mm. I would say that one great misunderstanding of 1949 is that it is often described as a liberation. That's what the regime says. And when you think in terms of liberation, you uh, imagine people applauding the arrival of the, the Liberation Army. But it was a military conquest and a very brutal one as Stalin and the Soviets helped Mao Zedong turn his ragtag army of guerrilla fighters into a very formidable fighting machine. It was very brutal. Um, in Changchun, 1948, big city in Manchuria to the north of Beijing, Lin Biao, a general, laid siege to Changchun for five months. 160,000 ordinary people starved as they were blockaded in that city. Changchun fell, other cities were besieged. Before you know it, all of these cities start surrendering, unwilling to undergo that horror. Well, the red flag goes up in 1949. This is followed uh, immediately by land reform, which again is often misunderstood as being about land. When you say land reform, you think land, but it was very much about creating a pact sealed in blood between the poorest of the poor uh, and the party by very much uh, forcing the poor and a majority of the population in villages to eliminate their own frequently elected leaders. In, in other words, they had to denounce people carefully targeted by the party, uh, people denounced as tyrants or landlords or traitors or dangerous elements. Um, about two million of them were killed, their assets distributed to the crowd. Those who refused to participate in these denunciations were denounced in turn. Um, so you could say that 1949 and land reform really is established uh, on um, is established through violence and by violence. This is going to be more than a minute, I think. <laughs> Give me a couple of minutes as I rush through the People's Republic. Um, this is followed by a number of campaigns against pretty much anyone and anything that might be opposed to a one-party state. In, in brief, from 1949 to 1956, all organizations outside of the organization of the party uh, are eliminated. Uh, religious organizations, um, civil associations, study groups, philanthropic societies, independent chambers of commerce, uh, student unions, worker unions, all eliminated and replaced by uh, the hand of the party. Uh, many millions also targeted directly uh, from October 1950 to October 51 as enemies of the people people who are seen to be standing in the path of the revolution, um, literally uh, eliminated in front of other people in stadiums in big cities uh, or um, on, um, on stages built in smaller villages in the countryside, shot in front of others as a warning. Mao gives a killing quota of one per thousand, but this, of course, escalates in many parts of the country, uh, it becomes two to three uh, per thousand. In other words, by the time that we reach 1952, including land reform, some five million people have been killed on purpose, have been targeted and eliminated. So in that clip, you just heard the first five million executions summarized very briefly in the history of communist China, just from 1949 to 1952. You're over 5 million people slain, executed. Not starvation, not other forms of death that later add tens and tens of millions to the body count. That's the first 5 million killed with bullets and bayonets and swords. Um, and killed in cold blood. Not killed in civil war. They weren't fighting back. Civilian mass execution. So it is a very strange era we're living through on the internet where it seems to be socially acceptable and monetizable for people to tell lies glorifying this mass murder in this history, but not to tell lies glorifying the other forms of mass murder. 
I, I'm not a free speech advocate. I actually really do believe in the moral purpose of censorship. Censorship can be done well and it can be done poorly. Um, in some cases, the function of censorship is merely to separate free speech into separate categories. I think it's very important that you have some websites and some TV channels that are safe for children to watch, some that have pornography and some don't. I think it makes sense to have some websites where you're going to see a certain level of violence, uh, the level of violence you see on CNN, on uh, new news networks that show scenes of warfare, and to have another TV channel where you know you can hear the news, but you know you're not going to see those scenes of violence. I think censorship serves a, a, you know a positive function in our society in many different ways. And I think that a country like modern Germany, it's a very interesting case study in what happens with censorship, where you have the government actively censoring uh, pro-Nazi, pro-Hitler statements. Nevertheless, Germany today in the 21st century has a very active and very open neo-Nazi movement. So the, the successes and failures of different kinds of censorship, I think, is a complex topic worth uh, questioning. I don't have a simple solution in the sense of saying, oh, well, let the left-wingers uh, promote their uh, propaganda and let the right-wingers promote their propaganda. Then somehow the truth will emerge out of these contrasting and, and contradictory claims. I think that is just as dangerous as saying, let's allow all food manufacturers to label their products as healthy, to make whatever health claims they want. I think it's actually very important that the government step in and say, no, you can't take a dozen eggs, chicken eggs, and write on them that this is healthy. Chicken eggs, scientifically speaking, are not healthy. So, you know, I think it's, I don't think you can sell a pack of cigarettes and, and sell people that they're healthy either. I think there's a very good reason for censorship and enforcement of, of labels and standards on these things. Um, however, when you get into the social sciences, history, and politics, there isn't even a clear distinction between fiction and nonfiction. There isn't a clear distinction between fact and opinion. And of course, it's, it's tragic that people live for many years ignorant of the real facts and cultivating even a sense of moral purpose and smug superiority over others because they've, they've become adherents to um, this type of propaganda, these, these types of claims that soften people up for that make people feel more and more comfortable with excuses for uh, mass murder, violence, versions of history that very intentionally paper over, downplay, and minimalize the dramatic failure of historically real communist regimes. In fact, one could easily argue that since these various countries had states and did not have worker control of the means of production, then by definition they were not communist. This brings me to the other issue. I have discussed this before in other videos, and I've discussed it directly with communists in debate. But it comes up here again, even in the very short clip I played for you of uh, examples of, of current and ongoing communist propaganda here on YouTube. The, the definitional fallacy, where communists will engage with absolutely no irony in a no true Scotsman fallacy, where they try to define communism in such a way that it, it exculpates, it exonerates communist regimes, or um, it, it, it exonerates them, where they say, oh, well, anything bad about communist regimes, that we don't have to take credit for, because that doesn't fit the definition of communism. And then as you see, even in that short clip, they then still proceed to make excuses for historically real uh, communist regimes. There's a distinction between etic and emic here. In a university classroom, we would never use an emic definition of what Tibetan Buddhism is. We'd never use an emic definition of what the Nazi party was, for example, nor the Communist Party, nor even do we use emic definitions of Islam. So, I mean, with each of these ideologies, let's use Tibetan Buddhism as, as the least, um, least shocking, perhaps. It's possible for a Tibetan Buddhist to present you with a definition that inherently glorifies their religion and excludes as not genuinely representative of Tibetan Buddhism anything they find distasteful or disapprove of. Uh, to give an example, a very real part of the Tibetan Buddhist religion was creating uh, bowls out of human skulls. 
They would also make musical instruments out of leg bones. Other parts of the body were used to make various uh, religious artifacts, shall we say. Um, you now, you can talk to a Tibetan Buddhist today who will, who will insist to you, oh, no, no, those traditions, you know, um, that's just folklore. That's not part of Buddhism. Uh, here's the definition of Buddhism we use in Tibetan Buddhism. Now, okay, so this practice, taking a human skull and turning it into a bowl, you know, you can include even more extreme things like human sacrifice, killing people to produce magic elixirs and so on. Okay, these were done by Buddhist monks in Buddhist temples with the authority of this religion. It very much was part of the practice, and as I say, real world political authority this religion had over people's lives. Um, you know, th there's a really meaningful and important sense in which we have to use an outsider's definition. Again, this is the etic versus emic distinction. Um, we have to use a detached outsider's definition and say, no, here's what we mean when we talk about Tibetan Buddhism. And the fact that people who themselves are true believers in Tibetan Buddhism, the fact that people within the ideology don't use this same definition, that's not a flaw with our approach. That's actually a strength. So in the same way, uh, neo-Nazis could give a definition of fascism or Nazism or National Socialism that exculpates them, papers over the failures and so on, uh, a proponent of Islam. This is very, very common. They will often give you a definition of jihad. Uh, sometimes they give you a de definition of the religion itself, how they, they define the Islamic faith. But they'll often give you a definition of jihad that's very misleading. It's misleading in terms of what the actual texts say the uh, Hadith and the Quran, but it's also misleading in terms of the historical application, the reality of what these things mean today and over prior centuries in, in the Islamic faith. They'll give you some very flattering definition of jihad, and then, of course, the necessary implication of this, again, kind of definitional fallacy, say, oh, well, anyone who uses the word jihad in another way, they're not really Muslim, they don't really know what they're talking about. So, again, this is the no true Scotsman fallacy. And the communists in 2019, they're, uh, they're playing this hard. They are, they are taking this to the utmost limit in a completely humorless, completely deadpan way. And I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I have now spoken to a few communists who talked to me later, after having the debate, got in touch with me a few weeks later or something, and said that they realized I was right, that this really was a very fundamental problem in their thinking, and they needed to change their, their approach to politics. Uh, the female voice who appeared on this channel. There was a woman who appeared only her voice, not her face. And we had a very confrontational debate about the definition of communism. She got in touch with me a few weeks later and she had really completely changed her mind on it after watching that video back and watching a couple other videos on my channel that were talking about, you know, the real nature of communism, the real history of communism. So that might be a positive example of free speech actually working. <laughs> um, but for every one example like her, there are so many more that just double down and get more deeply committed to this kind of propaganda. So look, uh, as I say, simply put, there's a lot of harm done by propaganda of this kind. We live in an era when people very casually talk about learning the lessons of history. Um, but history has no voice. You know, it's you and I who have voices. History is not significant for what it can take from the past. It's significant for what it can add to the present. So in the uh, controversy that I alluded to earlier of a right-wing group called Identity Europa being exposed on the internet because their private messages were shared and the private messages revealed the extent to which they were really a respectable front for much more difficult to respect right-wing extremist views. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the main impact of that, I mean, you know, what they're doing is not illegal in the United States. The main impact is getting their Twitter shut down, getting their social, social media platforms like YouTube shut down, getting demonetized, and even uh, some of the companies handling financial transactions and so on, where those get shut down because companies say, forget it, if this is what you guys are preaching, we don't want to do business with you. We're definitely living in a period of time where that kind of scrutiny is being applied to one extreme on the political spectrum and not the other. Now, I openly admit there isn't a simple solution. How can we draw up standards that are applied fairly and consistently? Maybe the standard is if you're lying about any historical event, 
that involves the deaths of over a million people. I mean, how is it you're going to legislate this? I'm over 40 years old, so I've now heard a whole generation of people say again and again that they were learning the lessons of the Vietnam War and then engage in a series of wars, most obviously Afghanistan, that absolutely repeated all of the errors of the Vietnam War. So the claims to have learned from history are easily made. The actual process of learning from history is quite another thing. Dun, 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 dun.